my uh, Facebook page. And then uh, if you could, could you mess with this, use your hotspot and uh, put it on YouTube on here? I don't know how to do that. You don't know how to do it? Where's Mr. Tim? Is Tim here yet? Yeah. Tim can do it. Is Tim here? Hey, Tim. Tim, we need you. Hey, Tim. Real quick, if you could come up, use my computer, um, and use your hotspot to stream on YouTube, that would be awesome. Stream live, that'd be great. We keep having these things. I don't know, man. I feel like we should sue Spectrum or something. Yeah, it's all his fault, right? All right, if you share it, uh, that'd be great. And then Tim can set us up on YouTube, and we'll be good. Um, there's always something, right? Uh, so got some uh, got some announcements for you. Um, first off, uh, women's study is this Tuesday at 7 p.m. at Ruthie's house. Um, so uh, our, our our Calvary Chapel Running Springs uh, women's study. Um, they're uh, they're going through a different series right now. Um, they've been doing some uh, First Peter and then another series also. Gosh, I forget her name. She's awesome. Uh, Elizabeth would have to remind me. Um, I've mentioned her before, but it's a really good series. I've watched some of them. They're really great. I've learned a lot through it. Uh, I'm not a part. I'm not. I don't go to women's ministry, but I'm always informed on what's being taught. Right. So uh, really good stuff. Uh, a few other things. If you weren't here when we first started, um, we're keeping the same guidelines. You know, social distancing. Masks aren't required. You'll see the servants wearing masks when they're engaging with people. Uh, just to be above reproach. That's what the government asks us to do, so that's what we're going to do. Um, don't need to get in an argument with anyone about masks right now. There's more important things. Uh, if you need to go use the bathroom inside, that's fine. You'll just get a temperature check. If you're 101 or above, then we can't let you in the building. Uh, so you can um, complain to the government about that. Um, don't don't send me emails about that. Um, so that device, all it is is a temperature gauge, all right? We're not uh, tracking you or doing anything weird or, again, giving you radiation. Um, simply a temperature device that's no touch. Uh, a few other things. Um, now, it, 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 because of guidelines and because of rules, but um, I keep having people come on the property when uh, they're not supposed to be here um, Really, you should only be on the church property if, like, you need to be here. If you're a volunteer or a servant and you're taking care of something, there's a bunch of people that have keys, um, you know, they come and go as you please, setting stuff up, whatever. Uh, but we're not going to, we can't, like, just, like, hang out at the property. The playground is closed. That's one of the guidelines. So please don't bring your kids to the playground. Um, uh, and this is like not just the church, the community does this too, uh, because we're trying to keep people safe as best as possible. And when we use stuff, we sanitize everything to make sure everybody's safe. Uh, but when people just come on, like there's no, there's, I can't like work and watch people at the same time. And so the playground is just like asking to spread germs and all these different things. So the playground's closed right now, unfortunately, hopefully they'll let us open it back up at some point. But that's one of the guidelines uh, for churches and in general. Um, so please don't just come and hang out on the property when, uh, when, when you don't need to be here for something specific. Um, uh, if you have an issue with that, you can talk to me uh, and you need me to explain that further. But uh, there's a reason we put chains up and things like that. Uh, there are certain areas on the property where we're in the process of doing construction, so we don't want anyone to get hurt. Like this cave here, we're demoing that, and we're fixing the handicapped walkway. Um, Hopefully that'll happen this year. Uh, but, uh, you know, a big, big thing is uh, on top of that is obviously we have COVID-19 to worry about. You got asymptomatic people and all those different things. And uh, sometimes kids will have it, have no idea. Sometimes younger people will have it, have no idea. And so we're trying to prevent any spread of anything. And uh, so they, in the guidelines, they've said that uh, we can't do the playground right now. Um, but also like just like right now just don't come in and hang out on the property unless you need to be here for something I get it. You're stuck indoors church is a safe place I know I wish people I just have people here all the time hanging out But unfortunately the season that we're in uh, we can't we can't do that And even in the past like when I'm here like when people playing on the playground I'll just let it go as long as they're not messing with anything. Um, it's kind of like a judgment call um, Had to boot some skateboarders a few times uh, but, uh, you know, right now, because of COVID, we're not, we're not going to be doing any of that. Uh, so please respect that. Um, there's signs in different places that help you understand that as well. Uh, so um, a couple other things. 
We are going to do the farmer's market outreach again this year. Um, the, we're going to do it three times in June, July, and August. The first one is June 27th. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm coming up with a plan because we can't do what we did in the past because we're not doing music. They're not having anybody do music. Um, so we will have a booth. And uh, I'm, I'm talking to different leaders to come up with a plan to try to attract people. The whole heart of this, now we're not having barbecues, so we can't promote that right now. But the whole heart of it is evangelism and reaching out to the community. Okay, so we'll come up with different, uh, different ideas to help cater to that. But the whole heart is getting out into the community, getting the church out of the church. The church is the people, not the building. Uh, so it's getting the church out of the church to impact the community. And the community needs the Lord now probably more than ever. And uh, we're the plan. We're God's plan to bring redemption to the to the world. And we know God will come back. Jesus will come back and, and redeem the world. But in the meantime, like it's us. Like It's dependent upon us sharing the gospel and making disciples. This is... Uh, an avenue by which we can fulfill the Great Commission. So I encourage you to come out. I'll give you more details. Uh, we'll probably meet there at 9 or 10 uh, and be out there the majority of the day. Um, so uh, please, please, please uh, uh, come out. It's, it's going to be fun. We're going to have a good time, and hopefully some people will get saved. Last year we had a major impact. Uh, we've had people that still come to the church from from some of those farmers market outreaches. And, and if, we can, if we can lead one person to the Lord, all the work makes it worth it. Do you agree with that? If we can change one person's eternal destination from the effort we put forth uh, during that, and we have. I've had so many people come up to me thanking me for what we did out there, how it changed their life, them getting plugged into the church and other churches. Because it's not about building up Calvary Chapel Running Springs. I don't care if they come here. I just want them to go somewhere afterwards and really take their faith seriously. But but they got to put their faith in Christ first. So this is an avenue by which we cater to that. Uh, the heart, again, is evangelism. It's outreach and evangelism. So that's June 27th. I'll give you more details. We'll come up with a plan uh, in the next week. Um, got a board meeting tomorrow night, and we'll talk through that as well. Uh, also, um, it, how do you think the country is doing right now? Give me some words that describe what you think the country is like right now. Sin. Sin. Chaos, right? Turmoil. It's wild right now. Like, we've never lived in a, high, a time like this. And, and you often see God uh, bring beauty out of ashes. He brings, he brings salvation through chaos and, and, and trials and division and all these different things. As we see the enemy working and we see sin thriving, God is on the other side working. He never stops working. Jesus said, my, my father, he's, he's never stopped. Yeah, he rested that sixth day, but he's been working. Ever, or that seventh day, but he's been working. Uh, ever since, you know, he never stops working. And um, uh, we have an obligation to do work as well. Uh, so one of the things that I'm going to encourage you to do tonight, starting the night, uh, we're going to do a 24-hour fast, okay? Now, um, I encourage you, if you can, uh, to fast from food for 24 hours, okay? Um, what you drink, uh, I encourage you. So how I'm going to do it, I'll just drink water and that's it, okay? Um, you know, I know some people, they need their coffee in the morning. You know, I don't think God's going to judge you if you drink a cup of coffee. Oh, that's up to you, you know. Um, but uh, but uh, we're going to do a fast uh, starting tonight and it'll end tomorrow night. So 24 hours. So, uh, you know, whenever you eat your last meal today, and I'm not making you do this. This is up to you. Uh, but I'm going to do it. The leadership of the church is going to do it. And, and uh, I see uh, so much of an impact it, it, through the word of God and through my personal life from prayer and fasting. It's such an important thing. Uh, Jesus said, when you fast, uh, with the expectation that we should be fasting. Uh, now, how often you do that, that's, that's up to you. I fast as I feel led to fast. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a get to get to attention, you know, as Jesus rebuked the, the scribes and the Pharisees for, like, just looking like their life was terrible as they fasted, all moping around and things like that. Um, sackcloth, and, sackcloth and ashes and the whole deal. Uh, it, it, fasting it primarily is a time to draw closer to the Lord. You're denying your flesh to draw closer to the Lord. I love food, man. I love eating. So taking that away to focus on the Lord, it, it does a lot for my uh, uh, for my relationship with the Lord. And we also see God move through prayer and fasting in the Bible. Perhaps 
As the church prays and fasts, perhaps we'll see God bring more unity to the nation. I've seen salvation happen through prayer and fasting. I've seen God work mightily in my life and in other lives through me personally praying and fasting. So I encourage you, um, if, if you're willing, you know, uh, I don't want this to be a burden. I want it to be a blessing. Uh, we'll do a 24-hour fast. So last meal you eat tonight, you know, that you can break the fast at that time. You know, I'm not counting the minutes. I'm not watching you. This is up to you and the Lord. Uh, but if you have a health issue and you can't fast, like, uh, for example, Elizabeth is breastfeeding. She can't fast right now because uh, that would force Kalani to fast. And I'm not making a six-month-old fast, okay? That'd be cruel, okay? A CPS would probably be calling me. But uh, uh, so she's going to fast from some other things that uh, sometimes distract her from her relationship with the Lord. So if you physically like it's a problem and you can't fast health reasons, whatever the case may be, uh, choose something to fast from. Maybe it's social media or TV or entertainment or uh, a bad habit you have or something that distracts you from the Lord. And it's not just fasting. It's what we do during the fast. It's a time to pray. It's a time to read the word. It's a time to engage with the Lord. OK, so uh, I encourage you we'll be doing it it's up to you and let's see what god does through this um so we'll start tonight we'll finish tomorrow night we'll, we'll break um uh we better break before the board meeting tomorrow night or otherwise we'll all be falling asleep at that board meeting um i usually get pretty tired when i fast uh but uh yeah so we're gonna do that tonight let me see i had a couple more things um so we're also um uh, hosting a blood drive on June 21st here. It, they'll be parked down there. So if you want to donate blood, it'll be an opportunity for you to do that. Uh, so uh, that's up to you. Um, we told them that they can use the property. It'll be here like around church time. So after church, if you want to donate blood, uh, you can do that. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, uh, lastly, we just finished uh, Ezekiel. We just finished Ezekiel, all 48 chapters. We just got through it. Who was a part of the Ezekiel study? I know some of you were, right? Man, I, I had learned a lot through Ezekiel. That was a blessing. And, and we see kind of the end, like one kingdom's destroyed. The kingdom of Judah is destroyed in the midst of Ezekiel receiving these prophecies. But Ezekiel starts talking about this new kingdom, this kingdom that will last forever, this kingdom that won't be ruled by uh, just a man, but the God-man, Jesus Christ. He'll rule and reign over the people, and it'll be it'll be all tongues, tribes, and nations coming to worship the Lord. So we see this emphasis at the end of unity in the midst of diversity. God promotes the diversity. Different tribes identifying with their tribe and their lineage, and, and they have this identity of where they grew up and who their forefathers were, and God says, keep that. You know, I want you to keep your diversity. I made you different. It's good to be different, but at the same time, you're called to be one. It's going to be one nation under God. There will be strangers in the land of Israel, Gentiles. They'll be treated equally with the Israelites, and it's just a beautiful picture. Uh, if you didn't hear the message on Wednesday and you'd like to, uh, it's on YouTube and Facebook. It really spoke to me uh, concerning our present situation, and I believe it'll speak to you as well. Um, I think there's a lot of wisdom there in, in what uh, Ezekiel says. Uh, or rather what the Lord says to Ezekiel. Uh, so this Wednesday, what book are we starting? Proverbs. Proverbs, right? We're starting Proverbs. I'll intro Proverbs. Really excited about that. Something the Lord's been putting on my heart uh, the last couple of months. And uh, Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And I think now, and a lot of it's circumstantial wisdom, okay? Uh, how truth applies in different situations. And, and we'll explain what a proverb is and give you some of the background behind Proverbs. But... Would you agree with me that the church needs wisdom in this age? Right? There's a lot of confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. But there are answers. There is truth. And God wants us to know the truth. And how the truth applies to certain situations. So we'll be, we'll be learning and growing in wisdom. But wisdom is not just something in our mind. It's something in our life. Wisdom, uh, defined by the Bible, is knowledge applied. Okay? It's the application of knowledge. Okay? So we'll learn that. I'm really excited about uh, doing that uh, starting this Wednesday. Uh, but uh, for Sunday, uh, for now, we'll be in 1 Corinthians. Uh, today, we'll finish uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, so if you would with me, uh, let's pray and, it, and we'll get into our study. Let me find my place here. Um, all right. Jesus, we thank you so much that you are constant. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the world is always changing. 
Uh, there are always issues in this world. This world is broken because of sin, uh, because of uh, Adam's sin, how it's corrupted the world, but also because of individual sin. And, and we all mess up. We all make mistakes. Uh, and we uh, all um, need purpose and we need meaning. And you offer that. You offer purpose. You offer meaning to our lives. Uh, you offer truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And we believe that. Uh, Lord, so I pray that you would show us the way, the truth, and the life as we continue on in this crazy season, that you would give us wisdom in this age, that we would be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We would know our role in society, that we would keep our goal of making disciples and preaching the gospel. We wouldn't get distracted by the enemy trying to wreak havoc on our lives and our families and, and uh, how he's trying to wreak havoc on, on our nation and the world as a whole. Uh, God, so I, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through this passage in a powerful way. Fill us with your spirit. I pray that, that, that we would hear the words of God. Your word is eternal. It's everlasting. It changes us from the inside out if we'll receive it. So I pray that we'll receive it today. We'll understand what it means to deny ourselves and be all things to all men and, and what it means to run this race of faith. So teach us how to do this and give us the power and strength and faith to walk it out. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been going through 1 Corinthians, right? Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, Paul is talking about forfeiting his rights as not just a Christian man, but also as an apostle. He had a certain measure of authority, so much authority that God inspired him to actually write scripture. And Peter, in 2 Peter, he validates Paul's apostleship and that his letters are truly scripture. They're inspired by God. Uh, but the, despite the fact that Paul had this authority and he had certain freedoms as an apostle, he choose, chose to forfeit certain freedoms. He chose not to have a wife while he was an apostle. Uh, he, he chose to forfeit provision from the Corinthians. He chose to, chose to forfeit certain things, even though he had a right to certain things as a Christian, as a, as a Jewish Roman citizen, uh, as an apostle, he chose to forfeit certain rights for the sake of the gospel and the sake of unity and for the sake of not making his brothers and sisters stumble in their faith. He says, I have the right to a wife, I have the right to provision, I have the right to all these things, but I've forfeited all of it for you because I love you. I would rather forfeit my rights than exercise my rights and lead you to stumble in your faith. And that, that's amazing self-denial uh, from Paul. He's leading them by example as he was showing them and telling them, even though they have the right to eat food sacrificed to idols in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, that they shouldn't do it if it's going to cause a brother or sister to stumble into idolatry or confusion or whatever the case may be. So Paul has been talking a lot about freedom and he's been talking a lot about denying certain freedoms. As we get into chapter 9, uh, we'll see Paul's approach to making the gospel known to as many people as possible. And it continues this theme of self-denial. Here in this text, uh, we'll see that he denied certain things. He denied certain cultural uh, uh, aspects of his life in certain settings so that he could be all things to all men. He denied himself so that he could reach the masses and so that he could finish his race as a good and faithful servant of Jesus Christ. The title of this teaching is Denying Self to Win the Race. Denying Self to Win the Race. Several times in Scripture, our faith is likened to a race, a race that you run. Has anyone ever ran a race like a 3k not just running around but like actually ran a race like or like a 5k or like some type of spartan race or anything like that right man if you're really running a race you don't run just to run you run to win and that's what paul is going to get out in this text but not only that you can't just walk into a race and expect to win you got to train right you got to train you got to be disciplined you have to have self-control athletes professional athletes they deny themselves of so many things so that they can excel in their profession. They deny themselves of certain foods. They deny themselves of the amount of food that they eat. They deny themselves of certain relationships that will hinder them from their goals. 
that they deny themselves of time, of sleep, of effort, of energy, of all these different things. Why? Because they have a goal. And that goal means more to them than anything else. You look at the discipline of some of these famous athletes. The most famous athletes in the world were not just physically talent, talented, but they were diligent and determined. Talent can get you far, but it can't make you the best. The best of the best have talent, discipline, and diligence. Anyone see that show, The Last Dance, uh, about the bulls? It's a great show. It's very interesting. I encourage you to do the TV 14 version because the TV mature version uh, has some swear words in it. The TV 14 edits those out. Uh, but it's about the Bulls, and, and Michael Jordan is the primary focus. Michael Jordan, he, he had some flaws, man, and the show brings this out. He has some flaws. I'm not pr promoting Michael Jordan as like this person that we should imitate, okay? He had some big flaws. He had some anger and, and things like that. But uh, one thing we see about Michael Jordan is he was determined and he was disciplined. Man, he worked harder than everyone else, and his diligence rubbed off on his team. He had such an influence on his team and the sport as a whole. He changed the sport, man. Michael Jordan was a man of discipline and determination, even when he went to play baseball. And so many people look at when he went to play baseball like, ah, oh, Michael Jordan didn't do that great. He didn't make it to the major leagues. But, but you learn something when you do the research. Michael Jordan would practice uh, would do batting practice hours before mandatory practice and hours after. He could hit a fastball. He had to learn how to hit a curveball. And he started learning and he started getting better. And his coaches said if he would have stuck with baseball, he would have definitely made it to the major leagues and perhaps been an all-star. Not because he was just physically talented, but because he was determined. He had a goal and he did everything possible to reach that goal, which went, meant denying certain things and certain privileges as he had as a very wealthy man at the time. In the same way, our faith is like a race. It's a race that we're all in, and it's a race that we should all be determined to win, that we give it our best, that we put forth the most effort every single day, that we're determined, that we're disciplined, that we're training in spiritual discipline. Because the goal is what? Well, there's multiple goals. The goal is to get as close to Jesus as possible and to become like Jesus as best as possible in this life. The goal is the Great Commission to preach the Gospels and make disciples. Okay, It's be a disciple that makes disciples, as our mission statement says. That's the goal. And as Christians, we're called to do everything we possibly can to meet that goal. Uh, sadly, uh, I see in uh, many churches, I think we have an amazing church, uh, but I see many Christians have a misunderstanding of grace. Uh, they assume that grace and forgiveness is licensed to do whatever they want. Uh, they assume that grace and forgiveness is licensed to be lazy in their spiritual walk. But that tells me you don't understand grace biblically. Because yes, grace is unearned, unmerited favor from God, but it's also a motivator and it's also a teacher. As Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 12 says, for by grace, God, God saved the world by grace. And he says, grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. It says grace should teach us to live a certain way. Yes, it's something that we receive, but it's also something that should impact us from the inside out. It should motivate us to go above and beyond, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.10. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, Paul says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, for I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. He says, my whole motivation for laboring more than all of them was because of God's grace. God's grace moved me to be disciplined. God's grace moved me to train spiritually. God's grace made me determined to run the race with endurance and win the prize. The prize is Jesus. The prize is eternal rewards. We'll look at some of those prizes as we get into this text. But sadly, sometimes Christians don't understand the concept 
of grace leading to self-denial. Because grace should lead to self-denial. The only reason we have grace is because Christ denied himself. Okay? Our reception of grace cost Jesus his life. He was determined. He had a goal. It says he set his face like a flint toward the, toward the cross. As He was sharpened. He wasn't looking. He wasn't distracted. He, he, he wasn't confused. He had a goal. His goal was the cross while he was off here on earth so that we could be saved, so that we could have a relationship with him. And that extension of grace should produce that same mentality. Setting our face like a flint. Seeking Jesus. Living for Jesus. Preaching the gospel, making disciples, not getting distracted by all this craziness that's going on in the world, not getting distracted by our political views and opinions. Great, you have them. That's great. We have rights. We have all these things. But a lot of times these things are a distraction from the goal and we can get caught up in the, in the wrong arguments and, and we try to persuade people to see our views politically like we see them when our real goal is or at least should be that people see Jesus as we see him. That they see him as the way, the truth, and the life. This takes denial of self. It takes servanthood, as we'll see in this text. It takes denying ourselves of the flesh, denying ourselves of sin, denying ourselves sometimes of certain views that, they, that we have, or at least denying ourselves of communicating certain views. I'm all about freedom of speech, okay? So don't take this the wrong way. But sometimes, in a situation, i got to deny myself from communicating my political views so I can win that person over to Jesus. Sometimes denying ourselves looks like immersing ourselves in a culture that's uncomfortable so that we can understand where people are coming from, especially in our day and age. We can make views and we can have these opinions, but we're only seeing the world through, through the lens of our own eyes and not trying to understand how other people are seeing the world, the issues that they see. And they might not be issues that we see. But sometimes it takes denying ourselves to have those conversations, to, to reach out to people that aren't like us so that we can lead them to Jesus Christ. It looks like denying ourselves of comfort often. And sometimes we misunderstand this. This is all part of the Great Commission, and this is what Paul's going to get at. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. He says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. Paul says, I'm not under bondage of any man, okay? But Paul is an apostle. There's no one that has authority over him over than, than Christ. That's it. So he's not, the church has the authority of Christ and the apostles. Paul, he is free. Like, he's an apostle and he's a Christian man. He's not under the bondage of any man, yet he's forfeited that freedom and chose to be a servant to all men. Who did he learn this from? He learned it from Jesus himself. Jesus chose to lay down his life and be a servant to all, forfeiting his rights in many cases as God, forfeiting his exercise of certain divine attributes so that he could be all things to all men. He chose to be a servant of all so that all had the chance to be saved. This point number one, we are free to be servants of all. We are free to be servants of all. That's a freedom. We are free to serve people. We shouldn't look at it as a burden. It's a blessing. It, Jesus said it himself in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. He says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was God. He could have demanded everybody to worship me and serve me. That's not how he approached things. He, 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 he earned it. He served men. He, he wanted to show them who God was. Okay, he, he wanted to show them that, that God, though He is Almighty God, though He is sovereign, He loves us and He's willing to lay down His life for us. He's willing to do whatever it takes so that we get the truth, that we understand who He is and how much He cares. And Jesus washed the disciples' feet. That, that was... In John 13, the night before he was crucified, he washed the disciples' feet. That's why Peter was so uncomfortable. That was a job reserved for Gentiles, Gentile servants. It's the regular, ordinary Jew wouldn't wash someone's feet, but Jesus did it. He, he broke cultural lines to get the truth across that I love you, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes so that you might be saved. 
And that's what Paul's getting at. I'm doing, I will serve whoever, I will do whatever it takes so that men will be saved. And again, this is a freedom. We shouldn't think of it as bondage or as a burden because often you hear the word servant or slave and you go, oh man, that's, that's bondage. But, but Paul saw it, saw it as freedom. There's a blessing in serving. As, as Jesus told Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, in Acts 20, 35, he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know what that word blessed means? In the Greek, someone tell me. I know somebody knows. Exceedingly happy, exceedingly joyful. He says, if you give more than you receive, you'll be exceedingly joyful. So the benefit is not just for the individual. The benefit is for us. God doesn't just call us to service to help other people. He calls us to service to help ourselves so that we'll be joyful. You see, more often than not, the most miserable people in this world are the most selfish So often when I find people, and yeah, tragedy and all those things play a factor in people's, you know, demeanor, obviously, you know, grieving loss and all that, that's, that's very valid. Uh, But when you see a continuation of someone that's always like, like Eeyore, always just down and out and life sucks, maybe I shouldn't say that S word from the pulpit. It's a Christian curse word, right? But when you see that demeanor... And I see that regularly. I know something. I know that there's a disconnect between them and the Lord, and they're being selfish. Okay, they're being selfish more often than not. The most greedy people in the world are the most discontent people in the world. Paul was one of those joyful people in the world. Why? He gave and gave and gave, and just like Jesus, he laid down his life for the sake of others. If we want to be joyful, we got to be servants. Who do we serve? Yes, we serve God, but we're also called to serve man. Who can you serve? Who can you serve today? Who can you serve this week, this month, this year? Okay, To make a difference in their life and make a difference in your life. As we're stuck at home most of the time, there are opportunities out there. And sometimes it's just the little things, putting ourselves out there. Okay, Making ourselves vulnerable. Being available for other people. And it brings joy to our hearts. This is one of the reasons I love ministry, because it brings me joy. I'm a selfish person. It forces me to be more selfless. And through that selflessness, it brings me joy. So Paul, he chose to be a servant to all. That was was a freedom that he had. Verse 20. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Paul says that when he interacted with Jews, he acted as a Jew. When they were following certain laws... He, he went under the certain laws. This wasn't hypocrisy, okay? He wasn't under the law. He was free from the law. He was dead to the law. But for the sake of winning that person to Christ, he immersed himself in the Jewish culture while he was around Jews. And yes, he stood up for righteousness and hypocrisy. He called Peter out in Galatians chapter 2 for sitting with the, with the Jews and making the Gentiles feel like they were less than the Jews, okay? So he, he played it perfectly, as best as we can tell from the Scriptures. But when he was around Jews, he, 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 he followed the law. Uh, we see this, examples of this in places like Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, if you want to flip there real quick. Acts 21 verse 23, it says, Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. These are Jewish men. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which were informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe we have written and decided that we should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. So Paul, it says in verse 26, he took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. So Paul, it appears based on the text, he was providing sacrifices around the Jews, knowing that Jesus was the final sacrifice. But in order to win these Jews over to Christ and not make them stumble, he put himself acting as if he was under the law. He kept the law when he was around Jews. Even though he says more than any other apostle that we're dead to the law. But around certain people, he followed certain laws. 
So when we're in different cultures, we should follow the culture unless it's a sin, right? We don't, we don't follow people that a sin. But we immerse ourselves into the culture. It gets, even if it's different, even if it's uncomfortable. Why? He did this to win people over to Jesus, okay? And we'll get into this more. He says in verse 21 of chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 29, to those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. So now Paul, he addresses the Gentiles, those who were unfamiliar with the Mosaic law, okay? And so he's speaking to Jews, they know the Mosaic law. And they added to the law with the Mishnah and the Talmud and all that. That's another story, man-made laws. But when he was with the Gentiles, he didn't put himself under the law because he didn't want to make them think that they had to follow the Mosaic law to be saved. So you had Judaizers during this time saying you needed to put your faith in Jesus and follow the Mosaic law to be saved, but which made the cross mean nothing, really. If you still have to keep the law. But around Gentiles, he didn't. He immersed themselves in their culture. He, he, he did what the Corinthians did, except when it was sin. He did what the, uh, what the people of Athens did. He did what the people of Philippi did. He, he followed their culture as far as it took them, unless, again, it was a sin. Now, these are people, though, he says, uh, are not under the law, the Mosaic law, because they're not, they don't know it. They're still under the law of God. He's speaking of the fact that God has placed morality in each of our hearts, okay? He, he speaks that in Romans 2, 14 to 15. Romans 2, 14 to 15. He talks about how those who don't know the law are still aware of the general law, right? It's wrong to steal. It's wrong to kill. It, it's, it's wrong to commit adultery. It's wrong to do all these different things, right? And we see in different cultures, the, the general moral law is very similar across the world, even if they don't know the Bible. Because God put that in them. So they are still under the law of God. And more importantly, those who know Christ are under the law of Christ, which is ultimately the law of love. And he did this, he says, that I might win those who are without law. He did whatever he could to win people over to Jesus. He wanted to relate to them as best as he could. Okay, And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. He says in verse 22, kind of wrapping up this thought. He says, to the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men that by all means save that, but I might by all means save some. He says, the weak I became is weak. Likely speaking of the weak of conscience, okay? Those who had convictions that weren't technically biblical, like eating food, sacrificed idols. He wouldn't do that in front of people that, that were weak-minded, that, that didn't understand the grace of God. Uh, but he would follow in their convictions because he didn't want to offend anyone. That the gospel's offensive enough. He says, I've become all things to all men so that by all means some might get saved. He says, Corinthians, just as I meet people where they're at, you need to meet people where they're at. Not everybody has your views. Not everybody's grown up like you grow up. Not everyone has the same ethnicity. Not everyone has the same gender. Not everyone has the same age. And all those things play a factor in who we become. And not, none of those things are bad. But he says, I related to every single person I best, as best as I could so I could win some to Christ. This is point number two. Be all things to all men. Be all things to all men. Now, this does not mean that Paul be all things to all men. I wish we had something that you could see. If you need the points and, and stuff after, you can, you can ask me. This doesn't mean that Paul changed the message of the gospel. <laughs> Paul is firm on that. The gospel never changes. The gospel is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The gospel is we are sinners. We are in need of a Savior. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So Jesus came, God, in the flesh, died on the cross, paid the sacrifice that we deserve so that we could be forgiven and have eternal life. Okay, The essence of the gospel. Led a perfect life, died a perfect death for us. So the message of the gospel is the same. But the delivery shouldn't always be the same, depending on who you're talking to. So the way Paul spoke to the, uh, the Athenians, the people of Athens, was different than the way he spoke to Jewish people. For the Jews, he promoted Jesus as the Messiah. And to the people in Athens, we see in Acts chapter 17, he promoted God as the creator, the unknown God. Okay, Because they don't understand, they don't know the scriptures. Okay, They had a belief in the Christ, but it was different than, than, uh, than, than how the Bible portrayed it. So, same message, but the delivery was different. 
okay? And we got to be careful. We got to make sure that the message is the same, but we got to make sure we deliver it in a way that's going to reach that individual person. This will only come if we choose to relate with people, have empathy with people, have compassion on people. We got to relate to people, man. We're all human beings. A black, white, Asian, yellow, green, blue, it doesn't matter what color you are. There are all things that we can relate to. And there is there are differences and there are beautiful differences between us and the cultures and the background and the ages and, and everything that, that, that uh, God created us with. But, but we got, there are things, many things as human beings we can relate with. We can all relate with the gospel. We can all relate with our need for a savior. But even when we communicate, we got to find that place of relatability, okay? You got kids, I got kids, okay? You like sports, I like sports, okay? <laughs> you don't like sports, well, we can't relate there. You don't like me, well, we're not going to talk about that. But there are common grounds that we can find with each individual. And we got to empathize with people. The only way you can empathize with a person is to understand who they are and where they're coming from. Put yourself in their shoes, okay? You don't know. If we just start spitting off at the mouth and just trying to force this message on people, okay, we're going to push a lot of people away. We got to hear them, hear them out. As James says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, okay? We got to hear people out in this day, man. Everybody's got their different views, you know? Is, is white privilege a real thing? Is, is uh, uh, systematic racism a real thing, okay? But we got to do our research. We got to do our due diligence. And I'm not going to give you my views on that right now. I don't want to get political. But why do certain people think that these are things? And why do other people not think that these are things? And what's the truth with all of this? Using objective criticism, but also understanding where people are coming from. I've been talking to a couple of my black friends every day lately. Uh, Haram and Braxton, trying to understand, throwing stuff at them. Okay, well, these people are arguing this, and these people are arguing that, because I want them to speak into my life. Though they were students of mine, they got a lot of wisdom. They're black. They have experiences that I've never experienced. I want to know where they're coming from. I want to put myself in their shoes so I can form my opinions rationally. Okay. we got to empathize. We have to have a compassion. Jesus had compassion. He saw those who were lost. And he had compassion on him. He had compassion on his enemies. He, 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 he forgave them as they were crucifying. You've got to have compassion on people. Have understanding on people. Again, we get so caught up with labels, but all these different demographics and all these people and all these different views, and we're talking about individuals here. We've got to meet people where they're at. And that's what Paul is talking about here. When you're sharing the gospel with someone, because that's, that's what he's focusing on, okay? Relating with people so that he can fulfill the Great Commission. That's the race that he's trying to win here. Fulfilling the Great Commission. We'll see that later. When we're sharing the gospel with someone, they got to know we care about them. Okay? If they don't think we care about them and they think we're just trying to convert them to some religion, okay? if they think that we're making it about us, but it's not about us, we're making it about them. The truth is I want each individual to know the love of God and know the truth of God and know this God that is so gracious and so merciful and so accepting that he will receive anyone and he can change anyone. I, I want people to have some kind of experience like I've experienced with God. Far from perfect, but without God, I, I know I'd be dead right now. I want them to know the love of God. That takes caring. That takes having compassion when sharing the gospel with people from different cultures, you have to understand their culture, or at least do your best to understand their culture. That comes with conversations, not assumptions. We've got to be careful about assumptions. Don't make assumptions. And not all black people have the same views. Not all Asians have the same views. Not all Hispanics have the same views. Not all protesters have the same views. Not all rioters have the same views. Not all policemen have the same views. Not all Democrats or Republicans or whatever the case may be. We're talking about people, people that Jesus died for. And we have this habit of lumping them together and using labels. That's not what Paul did. He saw each person as an individual created in the image of God that Jesus died for that person. And that's how we have to see people, even in our conversations. Even people of different faiths. Not all Muslims or Buddhists or atheists or agnostics or Hindus believe the same things. But we'll make assumptions when we go into that conversation. You've got to understand what they believe. There's so many different sects. There's so many different views. And we got to hear people out and understand what they believe. Not all Muslims believe the same thing, okay? Or any other religion. They're individuals. 
okay? That have different views about different things. We gotta understand who the individual is and love the individual. Ravi Zacharias, who just passed away. Gosh, it kills me. I love Ravi, man. His stuff like changed my life. His, his knowledge, his information, I used to listen to him every night. Um, but uh, Ravi used to say this all the time. He says, do not answer the question, answer the questioner, okay? Do not answer the question, answer the questioner. Meaning this, there's a heart behind the question, okay? And you gotta understand why that person is asking that question because so often the question someone is asking it is not really the question that they're really asking. There's something more going on in their hearts. We gotta do our best to try to understand somebody's heart and where they're coming from. We know only God knows the heart. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But getting to the heart of their communication, Jesus, because He was God, He knew what was in people's hearts. It says He perceived what was in their hearts. He knew their thoughts before they even said anything. And so often Jesus would answer people before they even said anything because He knew what was in their hearts. But even when people asked Him questions, He got to the heart of their question. Because so often people ask them questions trying to persuade him to answer it one way when the question they were asking is not really the question of their heart. For example, in Matthew chapter 19 with the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler says, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and he said, good teacher. And Jesus walks him through a series of questions. See, the rich young ruler wasn't really asking what he must do to inherit eternal life. What he was asking Jesus to tell him is that you're good and you're saved. But that's not what Jesus told him. He told him this. You're, in other words, your God is materialism and money. And if you really want to love God and you really want to be saved, you need to give that up because it's getting in the way of your relationship with God. So sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And it says the rich young ruler walked away sorrowfully. He didn't get the answer he was looking for. The point is we got to understand the heart behind the question. Answer the questioner. Know why they're asking these questions. And answer them according to the best way we can perceive where their heart's at. You know, so many people will make these claims about God and try to discredit the Bible, but a lot of people are just angry at God because bad things happen in their life. So understanding that, you know, the rebuttals that they have against the gospel and all these different things, there's answers for all of that. But, but what's the real issue? The issue, they're angry at God. The issue, they grew up in a culture that didn't recognize Christianity. The issue is, you know, whatever the issue is. Understanding the heart behind people's responses. Seeing them as individuals. And answering them as individuals. Again, it's about meeting people where they're at. Communicating to them in a way that's going to help them recognize that Jesus is the solution to all their problems. Okay? There are problems in this world. And I think there are practical solutions that need to be put in place. I won't get into that right now. But Jesus is the ultimate solution. Okay? If everybody was sold out for Jesus in this world, what do you think the world would be like? It would be a lot different. There wouldn't be racial issues. There wouldn't be entitlement. There wouldn't be abuse of power. There wouldn't be uh, lying and deception and, and confusion and all these different things. Jesus is the solution. And he's going to come and bring the solution. Okay? We know the world is going to be a mess until Jesus comes back, but we can still make an impact today by pointing people to the solution. And I'm not talking about discrediting the problems at hand. Hear people out. Understand where they're coming from. Be all things to all men. Immerse yourself in cultures. Jesus did this. Okay, Remember in John chapter 4, in John chapter 4 verse 4, it says Jesus needed to go through Samaria. That Usually the Jews avoided Samaria. Because there was racism between the Samaritans and the Jews. They hated each other. It all goes back to when the Assyrians took over the northern tribes and interbreeded with Jews back in 721 BC. So they were half-breeds. So the Jewish people, they considered the Samaritans not Jews. And they had their own place of worship. They didn't worship at the temple. And Jesus took his disciples through this place where they likely had racial issues with the Samaritans. That was the norm. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Why? Yes, it was for the woman at the well, but it was also for more. To teach the disciples that the gospel breaks down race, man. The, the gospel makes us all equal. We're all equal under the gospel. And he wanted to show them that. This threw the disciples off. Not only that, he talked to a woman. A woman. That, the rabbis worked to talk to women in public. 
So he addresses gender. He addresses race. And what he's really trying to show the disciples is that we're all equal. Doesn't matter what your race is. Doesn't matter what your gender is. Doesn't matter what your age is. We are all equal. Jesus is showing that. And in the same way, we have to understand that. If Jesus is the way, and he immersed himself in cultures that were different than his, because he grew up as a Jew in Nazareth, and he went to places that were different, like Samaria, okay? He related to Romans. He healed Romans. He preached the gospel to Romans. The Romans and Jews hated each other, another racial issue. But he went out of his way to immerse himself in cultures to reach as many people as possible, and that's why Paul follows this lead. So in the same way, that we're called to do that. Get out of our comfort zone and immerse ourselves in cultures that are different than ours. I, I, I'll tell you, man, I have learned so much from going to different cultures and going to different countries and, and doing my best to immerse myself in their way of life. And it ain't easy, man. It's different. It's difficult sometimes. You know, I lived in El Salvador for about 10 months with, man, way less than we have in America. Way less. And I was content in the Lord. We were ministering to gang members. MS-13, they ran our block. Really, MS-13 and 18th Street Gang run El Salvador over the government. And there were riots then because the president was trying to mix up the MS-13 and 18th Street Gangs uh, like in their schools and in the prisons. They literally had schools for MS-13 and schools for 18th Street, and they mixed them all up. So like 40 co cops got killed one, like in a matter of a couple months while we were there. And MS-13, they ran our block. So when we drove by, every time they're standing right there, you could only drive down that block if you paid them. But because we were part of the church, they always let us go, okay? We lived on the property. And, 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 and we'd have them over, and we'd minister to them, and we'd let them play soccer on our soccer field. And we try to understand who they are and where they came from. And, and, and you know why why they do what they do. That was crazy, right? What This dude might kill me. <laughs> who knows? That we found we, One student found, found human bones on our property. <laughs> there was a kid that was killed right down the street while we lived there. A, a gang member. But immersing ourselves in cultures. Liberia, Belize, Guatemala. Nicaragua, I've been to many countries, and when you go, you commit yourself to immersing yourself in the culture because God loves them equally, and they're different, and it's beautiful that they're different, and understanding the beauties of that culture. Though I love the United States, there are some things that I prefer more in other countries. I, I think the United States is the best country in the world, and I choose to live here because I love our country, but there are certain things in certain countries that I wish, man, I wish we were more like that, like Liberia. Man, they are so family-oriented, literally. Everybody eats out of the same bowl. Like, you have food, everybody has food. You don't just eat alone. You have food, everyone has food. You eat out of the same bowl until it's all gone. The family dynamic, the dependence on other people, it's a beautiful thing, man. I learned a lot coming back. Man, I wish, I wish we weren't so focused on self in America and so isolated and so worried about just pursuing our hopes and dreams and happiness. What about everybody else? Beautiful things we can pull from other cultures. But in order to do that, we got to immerse ourselves in the culture. we got to understand the cultures and understand the beauty in the cultures and where people are coming from. It's one of the reasons why I think short-term mission trips are so great. You bring part of that culture back with you. Colombia, El Salvador, wherever. Oh, we were supposed to go to Peru. We're going to try to go next year. But you bring part of that back with you. And there's always such a beautiful learning lesson with it. Is there a community not like yours? A community of different people from different backgrounds, maybe different ethnicities, maybe different colors, that you can immerse yourself with to learn something, to learn about the beauty of diversity, that whether it's whether it's a, a, an outreach, going to a, a place that you're not comfortable going to, skid row. But whether it's, it, it's immersing yourself in a, in a black community if you're used to being in a white community. We, we would have the Patmos students camp at Watts, literally outside on the streets of Watts, uh, the first week of their term. And you learn a lot, man. It's crazy, but it provides opportunities. What are these guys doing camping on the street at Watts? Like, isn't that dangerous? Yeah, it's dangerous, but they'll learn a lot. Going into the projects to preach the gospel and just love on people, man. You'd be surprised how open people are when you step into their territory, when you step into their community for no other reason than to show the love of God. People open up because they go, wait, really? You got a white guy 
in the projects? Like, oh, that usually only happens if they're trying to buy drugs. But this guy's just trying to love on me. He's trying to invite me to a barbecue. He's just trying to share the love of Jesus with me. It changes people. But we got to step out of our comfort zone and go to places that are uncomfortable for us to understand cultures and to love on people. And this is what Paul did. He went all over that area of the world and immersed themselves in cultures and was all things to all men. And how many people were saved through Paul? I don't know, thousands probably. Because Paul chose to be all things to all men. He saw the beauty of diversity. And he immersed himself in diversity depending on where he was. He says in verse 23, 1 Corinthians 9, Now, this I do, listen, for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker of it with you. He says, I'm doing all of this for the gospel's sake. (laughs) I'm laying down my identity as a Jew to go to these other places, like Corinth, like Athens, like Philippi, like Ephesus, like Rome, like all these other places, just so I can win people to Jesus. Don't think it was comfortable for Paul, because he faced lots of persecution for doing this. But the rewards outweighed. The consequences, he says in verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Paul, again, he likens our calling as Christians, our calling to follow Jesus, our calling to fulfill the Great Commission, because that's the focus here. Being all things to all men so that people hear the gospel. It's the Great Commission he's talking about. He likens it to a race that we all run in. Paul, he often uses examples of athletic events when he writes his epistles. The gladiator events, arenas, races, all these different things. He does it time and time again. Why does he do that? Why do you think he does that? Somebody tell me. Why do you think he does, uses these illustrations? What? Speak up. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Exactly. So they can understand. They can relate. You know? Yeah, maybe Paul's into sports. Maybe he's not. But the culture's into sports. So he speaks in a way that's going to hit home for them. Corinth loved athletic games, generally speaking. Uh, In fact, uh, they had the second most prominent athletic games in that area of the world next to the Olympics. So they were all into athletic games. So he speaks to them, oh man, like, I'm going to race like, oh, all these, all these athletes that I've always looked up to. Now Paul is liking me to one of those athletes running the race. And I see how these athletes train and I see how these athletes work and I see the athletes that win and I see what they do to get it. So that's how my faith is supposed to be. Paul says, yes, exactly. Do you see any of these athletes not training before they go on an event? Do you see any of these athletes not trying to win? Are any of these athletes jogging through the race? No, they're giving it their all. And this is Paul's point. Nobody runs a race to lose. I don't know about you. I've never done that. I run to do my best, man. I'm a very competitive person. And most of you know that. It doesn't matter what it is. Board games, soccer, and I wasn't even a soccer player. Baseball, football, it doesn't matter. When I play, I play to win. I got one gear and it's full gear. Doesn't matter if I'm playing with kids. Doesn't matter. It's a problem sometimes. I'll admit it's a problem. Kids have gotten hurt because of this. I've apologized. I'm trying to be better. Pray for me about that. But I play to win, man. I play to win. Like there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And this is what Paul's saying in your Christian walk. You got to run to win. Like don't just run to run. Like it's not just for the fun of the game. We got a, a goal. It's to, it's to win the prize. It's to reach the goal. This is point number three. Run your race to win. Run your race race to win. We're all in the race. If you're a Christian, you're in the race. If you're not a Christian, you're invited to join the race. All can all can participate. Okay? But we run this race to win. Okay? And in order to win the race, we have to train. You don't just step into a Spartan race after not doing any workouts or not doing anything. You don't just run a 5K. Uh, and never run at all. Like You don't just walk into the, the Boston Marathon and think that you're going to win something if you haven't been working and training and being diligent. we got to put forth the effort. Paul says, well, it's probably Paul. Hebrews chapter 12, the author is not mentioned. Debates about that. Another story. 
We're going to learn that from Adam as he's teaching through Hebrews with the men. In Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, in Hebrews 12, 1 to 2, he says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He, he says, man... The witnesses, the cloud of where they're watching. He, he puts the Hebrews in an arena. He paints a picture. He says, you got people cheering for you. God himself is cheering for you. They run this race to win. The only way you're going to do it is if we follow the words that he says. Number one, we got to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. You're not going to try to run a 5K with a 20-pound backpack on. Okay, unless you're just doing it for the challenge, but you're not doing that if you want to win the race. We got to take the backpack off. We got to lay the sin aside. The sin hinders us from running well. It slows us down. It's a burden. It's a distraction. It's making us fall. It's making us falter. So lay aside every weight. He says we got to run with endurance. That means continuing, continuous effort and energy. It's been said that long suffering is, is uh, how is it put, obedience in the same direction for a long time. Like, it's a continuous thing. Like, it's not a, I stop sometimes and I pick up later, I'm in sitting now and I pick, like, no, it's full-hearted commitment, endurance. Those who endure receive a crown, Revelation says. you got to have endurance. And in order to endurance, you have to train, which we'll talk about in a, se a second. But the third thing, in order to run well, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. That's what he says. Looking unto Jesus. He's our source of motivation. He's where we get our strength. And he's the goal. He is the ultimate prize. Our life is a race. And Jesus is the prize waiting for us at the end. And how we run our race determines what rewards we get in heaven. We all will get Jesus. If we believe in Jesus. With our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. But there are eternal rewards that are waiting for us if we run our race well. And this is what Paul is getting at, verse 25. He says that everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it for a, uh, to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. He says every, all the athletes that train, they're temperate. Temperate in the Greek means to have self-control. It means one who controls himself. That's what temperance is in the Greek, to be temperate. You have control over yourself. The Roman athletes, it was mandatory for them to train at least 10 months if they wanted to join the Olympics. They wouldn't even let athletes join if they haven't trained for at least 10 months because they'd be an embarrassment to the games. So he's saying we need to train. We need to have self-control if we want to win this race. This is point number four. Winning our race requires self-control. Winning our race requires self-control. Winning our race requires self-control. Athletes, they have to practice self-control if they want to win a race. There are certain things they have to deny themselves of, as we mentioned. Certain foods, the amount of food they eat. You look at mixed martial arts fighters, and I'm big into UFC and mixed martial arts. They got to cut, some of them got to cut 20, 30, 40 pounds even to get, to be able to fight that individual. Crazy what they sacrifice with their bodies. I can't imagine in a few weeks cutting that much weight. Dang, that's what they do so that they can compete and they can compete in the best weight class at the highest level. It's wild, man, what they do to their bodies so that they can win a fight. Athletes sacrifice all kinds of things. The sacrifice requires self-control. They know when to tell themselves no and when they can tell themselves yes. In the same way, this is what we're called to do as Christians. It's Galatians chapter 5. I want to look at a couple verses there real quick. Galatians chapter 5. He says in verse 16, Galatians 5, 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's simple. The flesh, as he's referring to it here, can, uh, he can use it in different ways. He could be talking about the human body, soma, uh, but that's not what he's referring to here. He's talking about that, that carnal nature, okay? That old man, 
that 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 kind of desires sin, really. He says if we walk in the spirit, we're not going to give in to the old man. If we're walking in the new man, we're not going to give in to the old man. Walk in the spirit, be obedient to the still small voice. Just do what God's asking you to do. And you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And listen to what he says in verse 24. This is powerful. Galatians 5, 24. He says, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's one of our goals. To crucify the flesh. This isn't a one-time thing. This is a daily thing. This is a daily putting our flesh to death. And it's a simple no. I'm not going to give in to this. I'm not going to give in to getting drunk. I'm not going to give into, I'm not going to give into pornography. I'm not going to give into adultery. I'm not going to give into pride. I'm not going to give into selfishness. I'm not going to give into these things that I know aren't from the Lord. It's telling the flesh, no, that's how we crucify it. We have to tell the flesh no constantly. If we want to be in shape to run the race well, self-control, it applies to all kinds of things. Self-control applies to what we do. It applies to what we say. It even applies to what we think, taking our thoughts captive. We need self-control if we want to run well. He says, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. He says, athletes are running a race to win for a crown that's only going to exist in this lifetime. He said, but we're running for a crown that is going to last forever. He's speaking of eternal rewards, okay? Again, every Christian gets heaven, gets Jesus. But the size of your mansion, so to speak, I don't really think it's like that. More like your capacity to experience perfection is increased as you run the race well. As you purpose to obey, as you purpose to pray, as you purpose to fast, as you purpose to read, as you purpose to love people, as you purpose to love your wife like Christ loved the church and respect your husband and preach the gospel and make disciples. There are rewards for all of that. And what we do now determines our rewards in heaven. Paul says run well. You won't regret it when you get there. He says, verse 26, we're almost done. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26, he says, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. He says, I'm not running with uncertainty. Paul knows what his race is all about. He's confident. He's certain of what the race is supposed to look like, and he's certain of the prize at the end. How? Because he knows his Savior. And his training as a Christian has produced, produced that certainty. The more we seek the Lord, the more our faith grows. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by our pursuit of Jesus. The more we're seeking him, the more certain we are. That's what he said. I'm not uncertain. I know, man. I know what my Savior is. I don't have any doubt. I have full-fledged faith. I know what's waiting for me at the end. And I know what it means to run my race well. And that's why I choose to do it. I know what's waiting for me. I know the prize. He says, thus I fight, Paul. He was described as like a guy with a cane, like a little kind of crippled, like big old nose, not the best looking guy, not the guy that you would look at and go, man, this is a powerful leader, right? Wasn't a guy that you would see like, man, that guy could kick somebody's butt. <laughs> but he likens this faith to a fight, okay? He likens it to a fight. It is a fight, the fight of faith. You ever been in a fight? I hope not. Sadly, I've been in many fights in my life. And when you fight someone, you're not just sitting there waiting to get hit. What are you doing? Like, you're giving it everything you got to win. Because if you don't win, they're going to win. And they're going to do damage on you. you got to put your all into a fight. He says, fight for your faith. Do everything that you can to be able to say at the end, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. That's what Paul was able to say in 2 Corinthians 4, or I mean 2 Timothy 4. He says, I did it, I ran the race well. I fought the fight well. He says, we're not throwing punches in the air. In other words, Christianity is not something that's wasting our time. Our, our Christian faith is all about fighting for the greatest cause of humanity. Fighting for people to understand meaning and purpose and knowing that they're loved and knowing what the truth is. Knowing that they're cared for. Knowing that even if they didn't have a father, they got people that love them and care for them. That's what the church is all supposed to be about. And one of the major problems in this country is a lack of spiritual leadership with men. And you see so many of these issues coming up in, in the world. Some of these issues being brought up and there are many issues. 
But so much of it has to do with people not having good, godly, spiritual leadership and knowing that they are loved by God. And that's our role as Christians, to help people understand that, to help people understand that Jesus is the answer, that they would know that they have purpose and love, that they are equal, that they will have everlasting life if they believe in him. Uh, Lastly, verse 27. He says, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul says, I recognize the need for discipline in my life, okay? I recognize the need that I have to tell my flesh no sometimes, okay? I recognize the need that sometimes I have to even even forfeit my rights, even though it's not a sin, but sometimes me practicing my rights could cause somebody else to sin. So I discipline my body. I know how to tell myself no. No, we can't let the desires of our body lead to our disqualification. He's not talking about losing salvation. I don't believe you can lose your salvation. He's talking about blowing your witness, okay? If he doesn't discipline his body, he's going to blow his witness. And when people see lazy Christians, they think, man, if that's what Christianity is, I I want no part of it. When people see Christians just being hypocrites and sinning and doing all kinds of stuff, they say it pushes them off to, it pushes them off to Jesus. That's how we disqualify ourselves. So he says discipline is essential to winning the race. This is point number five. Last point. Winning our race requires discipline. Winning our race requires discipline. Continuing to use this illustration of a race, that's what Paul's doing. He says you need to be disciplined, man. If you don't train, you're not going to win. Okay. One time when we first moved out here, Dirk wanted to do this Spartan beast race. I'd never done a Spartan race in my life. 14 miles, 35 obstacles, okay? You better believe I was training for this thing, right? I was running all the time in the mountains, you know, running 10, 12, 14 miles up here, the altitude. I felt like, okay, that's going to help. If I can do it up here, I can do it down there. Um, It was in Temecula, and it was 99 degrees, and the dust was just everywhere from people. So you're breathing in dust. It was miserable, But I trained every single, six days a week, took one day off so that I'd be able to finish that race. There was no way I was letting myself not finish that race. But if I just showed up to do 14 miles and 35 obstacles, climbing up walls and lifting heavy objects and literally climbing up hills, there's no way I would have done it. I had to train to be able to finish the race in the same way we have to train. It's daily training. You have to commit to the training. And we have to commit to the training. I had to commit to the training before the race even started. It takes practice. You often hear it said, practice makes perfect, but that's not true. Perfect practice makes perfect. You've got to train perfectly if you want to win perfectly. And that's our Christian faith. We've got to be disciplined. We've got to be in the Word. We've got to pray. And this isn't like putting a law on top of people. I'm just saying if you want to run well, you've got to practice well. If you want to make an impact in the world, if I want to make an impact in the world, i got to train spiritually daily. Disciples are disciplined. We've got to commit our life to the Lord every single day. Be willing to deny ourselves. Be willing to do whatever we can to fulfill the Great Commission. Real quick uh, story. Haram. Who knows Haram? Raise your hand if you remember Haram. Right, Haram, awesome dude, right? Haram is an awesome, awesome guy. So the first time I met Haram, I was actually a student in Patmos, and he was a leader at 4Kids. 4Kids is, uh, um, uh, they help, uh, like, uh, you know, kids that get taken in from CPS. They'll help, uh, like, older kids that don't have a healthy home to go in. It's an amazing ministry in South Florida. Um, But Haram was one of the leaders there, and uh, we cleaned his house one day, and that's when I met Haram. And he's, he's very creative. Uh, and he was doing some art, and I was like, dang, that's so awesome, and we just built this rapport, and I would keep seeing him places, and I was like, bro, like, you should come to Patmos, man, and, and eventually he came, in hurrah, man, he has so many gifts, he is a gifted teacher, he is a gifted leader, he is extremely creative, when he came to Patmos, it was like, he was disciplined in the things that he wanted to be, but he was often lazy, and he gave me permission to talk about this, he was often lazy in the things that he didn't care about, and I remember going through some challenges with him, like, Haram, you got so much stinking potential, man, but you're not going to reach it if you don't gain discipline. And he shared with me through a series of challenges, he realized, like, man, the disciples aren't undisciplined, they're disciplined. And he started being disciplined, and he came back as an intern. And man, Haram's thriving now. 
He's part of a, a missionary organization. He's a, he's a, a facilities manager. Monica's back in school. They're sold out for ministry. He's got, he's got a little baby now. Man, the Lord has blessed him tremendously. But I saw that change in Haram and how disciplined, how he learned the value of discipline. And it changed his life, man. That was one of the biggest lessons he learned in Patmos. And that's a big lesson that I've learned. I was not disciplined before I became a Christian, but I learned the necessity of discipline. And I'm a pretty disciplined person, if you, if you know me. I'm a routine guy. And those things have played the biggest factor in my life. Waking up early, reading. I, I like to work out, not that you have to do that. I wake up early, I read, I pray. I go to bed, I read a Christian book when I go to sleep. Like These little things make a long time impact. It's the little disciplines that help us run our race well. We're all in a race. Every one of us. But we're not competing with each other, okay? You're not competing with the person sitting next to you. You know what you're competing with? You're competing with your flesh. You're competing with sin. You're competing with Satan. You're competing with the influences of the world. Everybody's race is a little bit different. And everything we need to overcome is a little bit different. But we all have the ability to overcome. As Jesus said in 1 John 5, 4. Sorry, John said in 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Faith leads to overcoming. Faith leads to victory. But not just a faith that sits back, relaxes, and watches the world just fall apart. A faith that's active. A faith that works. A faith that's alive. A faith that's disciplined. Man, if we can practice that disciplined faith and run our race well, we will see God use the chaos in this world to bring order to this world. But it starts with you. It starts with me. Regardless of our political opinions, regardless of how we see all these issues, we can make a difference. And I'm being challenged in regards to how I can make a difference. And I want you to challenge yourself. How can you make a difference? How can you run your race better? How can I run my race better? How can I make an impact with everything that's going on in the world right now? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your powerful word, God. Your word is living and powerful. And it just, it never ceases to amaze me how as we're studying your word, you speak right into our situations, right into what we're going through in life. You call us to serve all men. You call us to, to, to be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath, slow to anger. You call us to, to be all things to all men. You call us to run our race with endurance, laying aside every sin that ensnares us, that, that we're called to fix our eyes on you. Lord, so I pray, God, that we would do just that. That, that we would fix our eyes on you, that we would run our race well, that we would make an impact, that we would help the world understand that you are the solution across the board. So help us, God, point people to the solution. Give us the boldness to do that. Before I say amen, church, real quick, if you would continue to pray, I know I've gone a little over, that's okay. We got one service, nothing happening after this. But uh, I want to give an opportunity for anyone that might not be in the race, Jesus invites us all to join this race. And this race is hard. The way of Jesus, it's narrow. It's difficult. But it's rewarding. It's the best decision I ever made in my life. Jesus saved my life. And he's giving me eternal life. He's done so much for me. And I know he wants to do so much for you. He is the solution to the world's problems. If we can filter everything through Christ, his truth and his love, man, things would be a lot easier. But he, just, uh, he doesn't just open that invitation to a whole group of people. He's, he's concerned about the individual. He met the one Samaritan woman at the well. He cares about you. He cares about me. He wants you to know that you're equal, that you're loved, that he has a purpose and a meaning for you. And all it requires is receiving that, receiving the message of the gospel, that Jesus died on a cross for your sins. He rose from the dead. And if anyone believes that Jesus is Lord and that he died for your sins, that he rose from the dead, he says you can have him forever. He'll change your life today and give you eternal life later. So if you'd like to receive Jesus today, this is between you and the Lord. I just ask you to repeat this prayer after me. This is between you and Jesus. Lord Jesus, I open my heart and I invite you inside of my life. I believe you died for my sins. Please forgive me of my sins. Please wash me clean. Please give me a new life. Give me purpose and meaning. 
Help me understand your love. Help me understand who you are and what you desire for me. Please give me the faith and the strength to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer online or here, feel free to either reach out to me uh, through Facebook or come talk to me. I'd love to kind of point you in the right direction. We got resources, and there's a lot more to say about a relationship with Jesus that we didn't have time for today. But please join us in worship as we close out. Everybody have a great day.